Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah. The pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan. Night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. It is Ramadan. It is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I am your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today, we will be discussing the topic benefits of fasting. Dr. Zakir, once again, I greet you with salams. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The benefits of fasting, Dr. Zakir. In the previous episode, we discussed the objectives of fasting. And within the objectives of fasting, we mentioned the spiritual, religious benefits. Are there any other benefits that you need to tell the audience about? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmeen, amma abad. A'uzu billahi min shaytani rajim, bismillahi rahman rahim, rabbi shahri sadri, wa yusalli amri, wa halal uqdat min lisani afka wa kawli. As far as benefits, besides religious and spiritual benefits, there are various benefits of fasting. And as you rightly mentioned in the last interview discussed about religious and spiritual, there are other benefits which can be categorized into three different categories. Physical benefits of fasting, there are psychological benefits of fasting, as well as there are social benefits of fasting. I see. Let's move on to the first category, the physical benefits. What exactly are the physical benefits? benefits of fasting? Since fasting mainly involves in abstaining from food, drink and sex from dawn up to sunset, here we realize that the stomach is the main organ of the body which has the maximum diseases, maximum ailments. That's why beloved Prophet Muhammad said. It's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 4, hadith number 3349. Our beloved Prophet said that there is nothing better that a son of Adam can fill in the container with more evils than the stomach. It is sufficient for a man to be on his feet with a few muscles. But if he has to eat more, he can divide the stomach into three parts. One third for the food, one third for the drink, and one third for his breath, or one third for the air. So what we realize, that the maximum diseases originate in the stomach, because there's house for bacteria. And the food that we eat, it enters the stomach. From the stomach, it gets digested, goes into the intestinal tract. Then the food nutrients enter the bloodstream, and then goes to almost all the different organs of the body. And we realize that the stomach is working continuously throughout the life. It never gets any rest. When we fast, this stomach, which is a very delicate organ, though it's very delicate, it is a very complicated organ. It's delicate, at the same time, it's very important. It keeps on working throughout the day. This organ, while we fast, when no food enters for several hours, it gets rest. And the toxins that are there in the body, they are removed, they are purged out. So fasting is a very good way that physically it's beneficial for the body. It removes all the toxins and it helps in various diseases. What about the psychological impacts upon the human psyche? 
regarding fasting. I think that's very important. As far as the psychological dimension is concerned, fasting helps in patience, forbearance and perseverance. It helps a person to increase his self-control, his self-worth. It helps him to increase the self-reflexivity. Also, the self-training and discipline is improved. The main psychological benefit of fasting is the increase in patience and perseverance. And it can make a person who says, I cannot do, it can make him say, I can do. And fasting helps in the conditioning of the heart, body, mind and soul. It improves the overall dimension of the human being. And fasting is a sort of training. It even helps in behavioral change. And changing a behavior is very difficult. A person who is used to a particular behavior, to change a person's behavior is very difficult. It is, as we say, that the best type of jihad is jihad for nafs. That is, striving against your own soul. So to change the habits is one of the things which is most difficult, which fasting can do. And since jihad, that is going in the battlefield, is of utmost importance when required, if you cannot do jihad, if you cannot strive against your own soul, how can you strive against the enemy? So therefore, fasting helps in that dimension. That's the reason fasting was made fard before jihad. Fasting was made fard 15 years after Prophet in the second Hijri. And next year, one year later, jihad was made first. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first wanted to train and make the Muslims fit psychologically with the help of fasting. And then the kital part was made first, so psychologically it's very helpful. And normally a human being, he eats three meals in a day, in a week about 21 meals. Now that is changed, that behavioral pattern of eating is changed to two meals, light meal late in the evening, early night, and before dawn. So the whole pattern is changed and this helps in various psychological aspects, the training. And today psychology they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. Actually, from the psychological aspect, myself, just to add something there, um, it was the fasting in the last week and a half of Ramadan which changed it for me. It changed my mind totally. Alhamdulillah. And that's what actually led me to taking the Shahada. Alhamdulillah. Basically, so Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I, that's why I mentioned the psychological aspects, very important. On to the next question regarding the social impact of fasting. Um, are there any specific areas that you can shed light on for us as today? As far as the social impact is concerned, in fasting, the person realizes about the other human beings who are poor, who don't have food, who don't have shelter. And it makes us realize that how does it feel when a person is hungry? Many of us who are rich, who have no problem of eating food, when we fast, we realize how does it feel when a person is hungry? So our love and our care for the poor people increases. And furthermore, even we realize the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many times do we really thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the food he has given us, for the water? Imagine the air that we get that we breathe. How many times do we thank Allah for that? So the food, the water which Allah provides us, the rich people hardly, their mind goes towards it, but while fasting they realize that. It helps them to care for the poor people. It also helps them in being generous with the other human beings, in sharing with other human beings. It also helps in forgiving other people's fault. So fasting helps the society in various ways. And furthermore, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sayyid al Jami, volume number one, hadith number 896. The beloved Prophet said that if you have mercy on those on the earth, then those who are in the heaven, they will have mercy on you. That means if you are merciful to the other human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on you. So this fasting, it helps us in building the society better. It helps us in being generous, helps us in being loving, in caring with the other human beings. And besides, not only the poor people, it helps us in being good with all the human beings. 
It helps us in being good with the family, helps us in being good with society. And many a time, we don't realize that we don't give enough time to our family, especially in the Western world. At least in fasting, you're with your family twice. And people make it a point that in fasting, at least they should do the sohor with the family and at least break the fast with the family. So at least they are with the family twice in the day. So the bonding in the family increases. There the family get together, the parents get more close to the children, especially in the Western world where this is neglected. As far as the society is concerned, it is very helpful in getting the society together. We many a time go to our neighbors. During iftar, we call our friends, call our neighbors. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, hadith number 5379. The Prophet said, whenever you're invited, do not refuse. So people invite each other during iftar, during the month of Ramadan. So it helps in getting the human beings closer to one another, whether it be yeah. the neighbors, whether it be the society at large. And it's also a very good time for self-improvement as well as doing isla and dawah. We meet people in the mosque. Many people who don't go to the mosque at the month of Ramadan, they come to the mosque. We meet them. We can chat with them. We go for tarawi. And this is the time we can do isla. We can do dawah to the non-Muslim. And as you rightly said, Ramadan was the month, the time we change your heart. And Allah gave you hidayah. This is very important. And that's why the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, mentioned in Sunan Tirmidhi, Hadith number 1924, that Allah bestows His mercy on those who themselves show mercy to others. Again, a prophet says, and he continues in the Hadith, that if you are merciful, the merciful will show mercy on you. And he further says that if you show mercy to those on earth, those in the heaven will show mercy to you. So, fasting helps in building up the society and getting people closer to one another. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. Let's move on to the next question. I want to come back to um, some of the points you were mentioning under the physical uh, changes and uh, benefits of the fast. What are the medical implications of fasting? There are innumerable medical benefits when a person fasts. I'll just mention a few of them. It organizes the heartbeat and relaxes it. It reduces the pressure on the heart arteries and it reduces the fat, the cholesterol, as well as the acids. It releases the pressure on the liver. Fasting also decreases the secretion of the digestive glands, which normally causes ulcer. There are less chances of having kidney stones when a person fasts. Fasting is also helpful in non-insulin-dependent diabetes. And fasting is also helpful in reducing the weight. Fasting as a whole, it is beneficial for the whole digestive system as well as central nervous system. Fasting helps in removing the toxins from the body. Fasting increases the immunity of the body. Fasting also reverses the aging process. It increases the longevity, lifespan of a human being. Fasting also helps in creation of more of T cells, which are known as killer cells. And fasting as a whole, it rejuvenates and overhauls the complete body. And there are various diseases which are helped when a person fasts. For example, a person who is suffering from certain diseases, and if a person fasts, it's helpful for him. For example, in cardiovascular diseases, if a person is suffering from asthma, from arthritis, from digestive disorders, if he's suffering from lupus, from skin disorders, if he's suffering from non insulin dependent diabetes, there are various, so this can go on and go on. And it is even helpful in removing a person who's addicted to things which are haram and even medically they aren't good, for example, smoking, or a person who is an alcoholic, or a person who's a chain smoker, fasting helps him in breaking this wrong habit and addiction. Let's move on to the next question. 
relates to the science behind the benefits of fasting. There are some people, and I want to know whether they're right or not, who say that fasting actually has some harmful effects on a person, psychological, social, physical, etc. Is that correct? Several researches have been done by many scientists as far as fasting is concerned and what effect does it have in various aspects of the human body. And scientists will tell us that when a person takes in food, it increases the metabolism of the body. When the food intake is reduced or when a person fasts, the body metabolism rate goes down by about 22%. And if you fast continuously for several days or for a month, then this stabilizes at a lower rate. So the body metabolism rate is reduced by fasting. Further, there was a research done on various groups of male and female Muslims who had fasted. And it showed that there was a slight reduction in the body weight. But there was an increase in the glucose level. As far as all the other things are concerned, it remained constant. Whether it was the testosterone or the cortisol, whether it was sodium, potassium, urea, whether it was cholesterol, whether it was HDL, high density lipoprotein, whether it was LDL, low density lipoprotein, whether it was TG, the triglyceride, all these, the body level, they remained the same. The fasting did not have any effect on them, except it increased the glucose level and there was a slight reduction in weight. When another research was conducted in Iran, where some men fasted for about 17 hours, for about 30 days in the month of Ramadan, it showed that it had no effect on the male reproductive hormone, on the testosterone. And it had no effect on the HPTA as well as on the thyroid hormones. There were several researches conducted. There was also research, there was a study made, which was called as increase in oxidation in the month of Ramadan on healthy women, a way for maintaining the weight, weight maintenance. And it showed that during fasting, there was no change as far as the physiology of the body was concerned, the weight was same and all the functions were the same. Fasting increases the fat oxidation and decreases the carbohydrate oxidation. And we have to realize that we have to let the physicians of the Western world, they should know, that they should note the levels of bilirubin and glucose while fasting. The further studies conducted that fasting increases the mucosa developed B lymphocyte cell responsiveness, but did not show a change in the B lymphocyte responsiveness of the rheumatoid arthritis and the health volunteers. But in fasting, it increases the longevity of the life, increases the lifespan. There were many researches conducted in animals, it increases lifespan. Further research was conducted on the lactating women when they fasted, the fasting did not increase or decrease. There was no change in the milk volume as well as the content of the milk. The glucose level was the same. The fat concentration was the same. The lactose content was the same. There was no change per se as far as the lactating mothers were concerned. There were researches done regarding fasting's effect on menstruating women as well as the reproductive cycle and when the research was done there was no change whatsoever there wasn't any change in the menstrual cycle in fasting or there was no negative effect no positive effect so it is wrong to say that fasting has an ill effect there are many benefits which we discussed earlier but there are certain positive points that fasting has helped in certain diseases for example rheumatoid arthritis Osteoarthritis, it helps. And what we realized that when researches were done, that on animals, when they are sick, they don't prefer having any food. Same thing with the children. When children get sick, they don't prefer having food. It is the family members who force them to have food. And research has shown that 
when food is taken when a person is sick, it prevents him from getting well early. It hampers the immune system. So when a person fasts, when he's seriously ill, it helps him to recover faster. That is the reason now we find that there are many treatments which include fasting for various diseases which are followed by the Western world. Because when a person fasts, his body gets rest and the toxins are removed from the body. So it helps him to recover faster. And fasting is also good to change the behavioral pattern. And if a person is addicted or a person is alcoholic, as I mentioned earlier, or is a chain smoker, if he fasts, it's a good point that he can stop it throughout his life. And people who are habituated to things like tea, coffee, junk food, when they fast and they stay away from it, when the taste buds they don't have for the full month, the taste buds don't crave for that. And when they have healthy food, they start liking it. So it's a good time to stay away from junk food. If you can do it for one month, you can do it throughout your life. Yes. And there are certain diseases. For example, insulin-dependent diabetes. A person who's suffering from insulin-dependent diabetes, he should not fast because he has ketosis. Normally, the ketones are used as a source of energy. But if a person has insulin-dependent diabetes, he's unable to use this. So therefore, a person who has insulin-dependent diabetes, he should not fast. But naturally, if he takes insulin and fasts and with the medical advice, it's fine. But the other type of diabetes, which is more common, non-insulin-dependent diabetes, fasting is helpful for that. And as I mentioned earlier, it's helpful in various diseases like cardiovascular disease, asthma, arthritis, digestive tract diseases, in lupus, in skin disease. You can name a list of diseases in which fasting is of great benefit. I think it would be really interesting to know, I mean, this research, has it been done by Muslims or non-Muslims? These researches have been done by both Muslims and non-Muslims. And there are hundreds of non-Muslim scientists who have done research on fasting. So it's not only the Muslims. More of the non-Muslims do research on fasting. But there are even Muslims. For example, if you read the book, Fasting, A Way of Life, by Alan Cott, he writes that fasting is altogether, it gives rest to the digestive tract as well as the central nervous system for the whole body. And he's a non-Muslim. There was a research done by Indian doctor by the name of Dr. Shanti Rangwani. And she says that when a person fasts, there's no intake of food. So the toxins are created by the food that you eat. So no new toxin is created. And whatever toxin is there present in the body from before, it gets excreted from the body. So fasting, is a very good method of excreting all the toxins from the body and it purifies the body system. It was done by non-Muslim. The research is done even by Muslim. The research done by Dr. Suleiman in the University Hospital in Amman in Jordan. And he did a research on a group of men and women. There were 42 men and 26 women. And the research was done that they fasted and the changes in the body was noted. And they found out that there was a slight reduction in weight. And there was an increase in the glucose level. But as far as the other components are concerned, testosterone, cortisol, sodium, potassium, urea, all of them remained the same. There was no change as per in the body control, except the glucose level increase and the reduction in the weight of the human being. There were several researches done by non-Muslims. There was a group of non-Muslim scientists who did research in Africa in areas where there were famine. And they realized that people, when they did research, that people who were starving because of famine, and they lived in the same refugee camp. Some people who had food and some people who were starving. But those who were starving, they had less chances of having tuberculosis as well as malaria. So fasting, increase the defense mechanism against tuberculosis and malaria. So it's Allah's mercy, alhamdulillah. Can you believe, because they were starving, 
it prevented them from having tuberculosis as well as malaria. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> the researches done by non-Muslims show that fasting increases the longevity, increases the lifespan, and it has a reversal on the aging process. There was a research done by a Muslim scientist by the name of Dr. Osama Kandil in the Harvard University. Muslim, but in a non-Muslim country, non-Muslim university. And he did a research on patients suffering from cancer. And he tried to find out what way do the cells function, especially the killer cells, which attack the cancer cells. And he did a counting just before they started fasting. And then he again did a counting on the 21st day of Ramadan, then 28th day of Ramadan. And he found that there was a marked difference. After 21 days and 28 days, the number of cells, the killer cells, they increased. And these cells, they attacked the cancer cells. And it shows that even the immunity increased. The defense mechanism of the human being, because of fasting, it increased. And there was another research again done in the same patients and it found out that the T cells which are normally required for the defense immunity of the human being, they increase to a gate level. And T cells are mainly responsible when anyone has a disease, they are mainly the soldiers or they are called the major general of the army that you have. They are the T cells and they go and they see to it, any disease is there, it goes and try and destroy the disease. And AIDS is the disease which mainly attacks these T cells. Therefore, it's known as acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So when you fast, these cells increase and the immunity of the human beings increase. I would like to mention one more research done by a European non-Muslim by the name of Dr. Jeffrey. And what he says that fasting is not only done by human beings. Fasting is even done by the animals and the plants. And he gives the example, animals that live in cold countries during heavy snowfalls, they stay separately and they don't eat and they go in hibernation. And there are examples of animals like frog, which go in hibernation. And here they don't eat, they fast. And he gives the example in his book that even the trees, in winter, when they don't get water, they're fasting. But the moment later when spring comes, you find that the tree is filled up with colorful leaves, with flowers, with fruits. And he suggested that every human being, every year, should at least fast for 40 days. And we know that it's first for every Muslim to fast in the month of Ramadan, that's approximately 30 days. And Further, if you keep the six days of fasting in Shawwal, that makes it 36 days. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Prophet has already given us this guidance which the non-Muslim European has given us recently. So, the many researches done by non-Muslims on fasting and it's very beneficial for the human body. Dr. Zakir, most of the research that you've mentioned, I suspect a lot of the other research we haven't had time to mention today, um, was done relatively recently. Um, was this knowledge, this scientific knowledge, available for the Muslims in history? As far as the earlier Muslims are concerned, some of the facts were known, some were not known, not in the same way as we have come to know by the first today. And I'll give you the reason why later. But the main question is concerned that, were they aware about these aspects of fasting? in a different way, may not be in the same way as we know today. That reminds me, I read a book by Maulana Abul Hassan Nadwi, Arkanul Arba, where Maulana Abul Hassan Nadwi, he writes in his book, Arkanul Arba, and he gives an incident at the time of Khalifa Harun Rashid. And there he gives a dialogue between the Christian physician of Khalifa Harun Rashid and a Muslim by the name of Ali bin Hussein bin Waqid. And this Christian physician of Khalif Harun Rashid, he says that the Quran is considered to be a book of sciences. And we know there are two types of sciences. 
science of the body, science of the soul. So what does your Quran speak about medical science? So Ali bin Hussein bin Waqad, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in half a verse of the Quran, he combines both these sciences. When he says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 31, eat and drink, but do not waste in excess. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes not the people who waste. Then the Christian scientist says, but what did your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu say about medicine? So he said that he's mentioned that the stomach is the main house of diseases and prevention is the best thing for ailment. And prevention is better than cure. And as I mentioned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number four, hadith number 3349, the Prophet said, the son of Adam does not fill a vessel more worse, more evil than the stomach. A few morsels are sufficient to keep him on his feet. If he has to eat more, one third of the stomach can be of food, one third drink, and one third should be for his breath. So then that Christian physician said, that means when you had the guidance of your Allah and Prophet Muhammad, we did not require jaliness. Jaliness, he was a very famous non-Muslim physician of that time. So what the Prophet and Allah say is a telegraphic message, which we have done research today. But the Prophet also already has given in a nutshell the message before. And in that same book, Arkan al-Arba, Mawlana Abul Hassan Nadwi, he mentions and he gives the example of another non-Muslim scientist who is an American. He says that every human being, whether poor or rich, he should fast for some days every year. It will keep him healthy. And then he says that Islam is the best religion which has made it compulsory on his followers to fast. And he said that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the best physician who has prescribed fasting. And he said that there's no better healthy way than fasting. And after that tarawih, in which you have to do some exercise, according to him, which helps in digestion. So if you realize that the non-Muslims appreciated the religion of Islam after doing research. Though many of the Muslims are aware about the medical benefits of fasting, but we Muslims, we don't fast for these medical benefits. We fast for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't fast for the medical benefits. These medical benefits are ancillary. Yeah. Or they may be the, maybe sweet dishes, maybe the desert. Our main biryani, our main meal course is for pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we discussed in the objective of fasting. We don't fast for the medical benefits. Even if these medical benefits were not there, we Muslim would have fasted for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as whatever we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah gives us back in return. So all the acts that we do, it actually benefits us in various ways in this world as well as in the Akhira. But we Muslims don't fast for these medical benefits. These are just bonuses that we get, irrespective of whether we get or not, yet we'll fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, that's good. So when you listen to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at his life and implement those things, Immediately you get some benefit in this world. Um, Subhanallah. Um, and Dr. Zakir, may Allah give us great benefits through the fasting. We've discussed so many benefits. There's so many to discuss, Dr. Zakir. I think we could have three programs on this, just <laughs> on this subject alone. But alas, <laughs> we can't spend that much more time in the interview stage because it's come to an end. And we need now to take some questions from the audience, from the people watching Peace TV. So let's move on now. The first question we have from one of our viewers is, many Muslims fast during the day but overeat in the night time during the month of Ramadan. Many eat more food in the month of Ramadan during the nights than they do during non-Ramadan time. 
Will they be in a position to derive the medical benefits that the person who doesn't eat too much will get? As far as deriving the medical benefits, those people who overeat in the night, and we know there are many Muslims, unfortunately, who eat a lot during iftar, they eat in excess, and many of them keep on eating most part of the night, and then they fast. This is against the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 31, eat and drink, but waste not by excess. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like the wasters. Here we know people buy food, they have iftar parties where they make a variety of dishes, it goes in waste and a loss of lot of money which can benefit the poor people. Surely this is not the way of Islam. And as I mentioned earlier, beloved Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Majah, volume number 4, hadith number 3349, that the son of Adam does not fill a vessel more worse than the stomach. Few muscles are sufficient to keep him on his feet. If he wants to eat more, you should divide the stomach in three parts, one third for food, one third for drink, and one third for his breath, or one third for air. Based on this, but natural overeating is against the sunnah, against the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even he will not get the benefit of fasting. Fasting means a person abstains from food, and then has normal, doesn't overeat. So most of the benefits that are mentioned in the medical benefits, most of them he will not get. Some he may get. Sometimes, if he overeats excessively, it may cause a damage to health. It's like, I gave the example in the last episode, person eats, then he puts his finger in the throat and vomits out. So the food he eats will not make him healthy. So here the fasting will not benefit if he overeats. It goes against the principle of fasting. Good. I think that's a very uh, concise answer. And that's what we need. There's lots of questions to get through, Dr. Zakir. Second question from one of our viewers again, if a Muslim fast with an intention of reducing his or her weight uh, or dieting, will he get the reward of fasting, he or she? If you're talking about reward in general, Islamic, they're talking about Jannah, forgiveness, etc. Our beloved Prophet said in Sunan Tirmidhi, Book of Fasting, Hadith number 2331, that there's no fast for a person who does not intend to fast the night before. Intention is a must. Intention means for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who doesn't have this intention, surely he will not get the religious benefits. He will not get the spiritual benefits. The reason why we fast, that is taqwa, what we discussed in the last episode. As far as the other medical benefits the person does for dieting, or if he does for weight loss, he may get those benefits. Like there are people who fast maybe for political reason, people do hunger strike, people, they fast for a pressure. Some people fast, as we mentioned, for weight loss, for dieting. So that part of the medical benefit they may get, but not the benefit completely of Islam. And as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 15 and 16, Anyone who does any deeds for this world, Allah will show, give him the reward without diminishing for this world. But he will have no reward in the hereafter, except for hellfire. And he's really, the person who does such deed is really misguided. So fasting only for weight loss, dieting is just, it is penny-wise pound foolish. What I've realized that we have to mainly fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we get the overall benefit. Okay, I'd prefer to be a little bit fat and then, uh, but go to paradise actually, wouldn't you? <laughs> okay. No, you can become thin and yet go to paradise. <laughs> yes, if sir. you fast the complete right way, like the sunnah of the Prophet Absolutely. Muhammad Absolutely. Muhammad wasn't fat. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get your point, Dr. Zaki. Next question. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we've heard in previous uh, episodes of the series, um, used to break fast with the dates. And it's uh, therefore highly recommended to break fast with the date. Um, can you inform us about the medical benefits of dates? Dates is a wholesome food. Dates contain a high level of carbohydrates, 44 to 88 percent. 
it has a low fat content, 0.2 to 0.5 percent. There are about 15 minerals and salts in dates, about six vitamins. The protein level is 2.3 to 5.6 percent. It has a high fiber content, 6.4 to 11.5 percent, depending upon the different types of dates. And if you realize that because of the high carbohydrate content, it is a very good source of energy. The moment you have date, immediately it gives you energy. It is far better than any other, whether you have the glucose powder, etc. The date gives instant energy. And a person can survive only on dates and water for days and months together. And our Prophet Muhammad there used to be no food for days and weeks together in his house and he used to survive only on date and water, sometime on date and camel milk. So date is a wholesome food. The fat content, it doesn't increase the weight, hardly any. So there's no risk a person who is, you know, afraid, oh, the weight will increase. That's not there. As far as the minerals are concerned, it contains about 15 different minerals. It even contains fluoride, which prevents the tooth decay. It contains selenium, which fights against cancer and increases the immune system of the human body. It contains about six vitamins, though to a less degree, less content. It contains vitamin C, vitamin B1, vitamin B2, niacin. It contains vitamin A. It has proteins which have 23 different amino acids. And this fruit date has amino acids, which are not contained in other fruits which normally people have. It's not present in apple, oranges, banana, but it is there in the date. And date also has a very high content of fiber. It's a fibrous diet. So it's good for digestion. When you have date, the digestion gets cleared. It can cure constipation and the digestive system is clear. It has various benefits and it is a wholesome food. And we realize that Alhamdulillah, in the last 40 years, the production of date has increased by 2.9 times. And the population of the world has increased twice. So the dead population is much more than the population of the human beings because it's very wholesome food and instant energy. Next question. Somebody wants to know how does fasting differ from anorexia? Anorexia by definition means loss of appetite. It's a medical word used for loss of appetite. And many a time this happens in certain people, those who are dieting. It's common in young ladies. It's a sort of a disease that those who diet, they abstain from food and then that becomes the habit and they don't want to have anything. And sometimes they may go into anorexia nervosa, that psychological disorder that they fear eating, thinking that if they eat, they will increase weight and that becomes a psychological disorder. So anorexia is nothing but loss of appetite and dieting is not preferred because most of the people that diet, the moment they come off the diet, they either go into anorexia nervosa, that's a psychological disorder which I mentioned, which they fear eating anything, increase of weight, and then they lose weight, the health goes down, or they go into a binge of overeating, you know, a bulimic, you know, they eat excessive food. And there were several researches conducted on this, including in Michigan in 1995, where about 557 young ladies enrolled in the university, out of which 86% were dieting. Only 2% of them, they used to eat excessively. But in six months' time, 19% added into the bulimic category. They started eating more. Because the moment you stop dieting, you tend to eat excessively and become more fat, or you go vice versa on the other side, androgs and nervosa, where you don't eat at all, and that damages your body. Subhanallah. Well, you're going to help us not to get into that. Next question. What is the scientific difference between fasting and starvation? Fasting, scientifically, starts somewhere close to within 12 hours to up to 24 hours. And when the carbohydrate reserves of the body 
are used as a source of energy, it's called as fasting. Moment, it starts after maybe a few hours. Initially, the food is utilized. When the food intake reduces, and when the carbohydrate reserves of the body is used for energy source, it's called as fasting. But after the carbohydrate source in the body depletes, gets completely used up, then the protein is used. When protein is used as a source of energy, it's called as starvation. Then you find that the muscle mass keeps on reducing, the person becomes thin, and it becomes unhealthy. Scientifically, when the carbohydrate source gets depleted and the protein source is used, it's called as starvation, which is not good for the body at all. Fasting is healthy for the body, starvation is unhealthy. Well, Jazakallah khair. Once again, Dr. Zakia, and we've heard many benefits of fasting tonight, and I hope and I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to take those benefits, those benefits and the instructions you've given tonight and utilize them during this wonderful month of fasting. Jazakallah khair. Dear brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow benefits for the whole of this month regarding the fasting, especially as now you've got no excuse because you've heard all the medical raison d'etre and all the spiritual, religious, physical, psychological, medical reasons. You've got absolutely no excuse. So please take benefit of Dr. Zakir Knight's advice in this show and in the preceding shows and we will join you same time tomorrow when we will be discussing Ramadan the month of repentance Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <laughs> يومنا صبر ورفق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأقل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي كل بي